life on earth is a pilgrimage. A journey towards a destination. So that we will be able to carry the cross faithfully until the end of our lives. But before any traveler can set out for his destination, he must first of all know how to get to where he wants to go. We are pilgrims. And in the pilgrimage, it is visiting the Lord. For us Catholics, Heaven is a real destination and goal in life. When we become part of the mystical body, we become divinized. In the Apostles' Creed, we have been given the road map that will guide us to heaven. A road map that is now well explained in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I am Father Bing Arolano, International Spiritual Director of the Alliance of the Holy Family International, a global family movement dedicated to the sanctification of the family, youth, clergy, and media by consecration to the hearts of Jesus and Mary. and by living the grace-filled, sinless lifestyle of the communion of reparation. Welcome to the Alliance of the Holy Family International Primary Formation Course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Church is the congregation of all baptized persons united in the same true faith, the same sacrifice, and the same sacraments under the authority of the sovereign pontiff or the pope and the bishops in union with Him. It is an infallible dogma of Catholic faith that outside the Catholic Church there is no salvation. This article of faith was first expressed by Saint Cyprian of Carthage, a bishop in the third century, and was reconfirmed by Pope Innocent III in 1208. The profession of faith of the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 by the papal bull Unam Sanctum of Pope Benefice VIII in 1302 and by the profession of faith of the Council of Florence in 1442. The belief that there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church has been frequently repeated over the centuries as an ordinary and universal magisterium of the Church and confirmed by the Second Vatican Council. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, which was officially promulgated for the Catholic Church by John Paul II in 1992 sums up in book form the beliefs of the Catholic faith. It also explains why we hold the article of faith extra ecclesia nulla salus or outside the church there is no salvation as an infallible dogma found in article 846 to 851 of the Catechism because all salvation comes from Christ, the head, and through the church, which is his body. 
The theological basis for this doctrine is founded on the belief that one, Jesus Christ personally established the one church, and two, the Catholic Church serves as the means by which the graces won by Christ are communicated to believers. Sadly, left-leaning religious priests and bishops from the third world countries are more concerned in being social workers, fighting for the rights of the poor people, than in saving souls. This was lamented by John Paul II who said that anyone could be a social worker, but not everyone could be a priest or religious who could do the most valuable role of administering the sacraments and evangelizing all peoples. Benedict XVI on March 17, 2016, during an interview with a Catholic News General, also condemned this error, which rejected the Council of Trent's dogma that a person who is not baptized is damned. He also decried religious and priests following the error of the German Karl Runner, the Jesuit priest who espoused the belief that any religion will eventually lead to salvation. Benedict XVI strongly pointed out in this interview that the fullness of truth and grace is given by Jesus Christ, the only mediator to the only church he founded, the Catholic Church. For in Matthew 16, 13 to 18, we read, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and not even the gates of hell shall prevail. Benedict XVI therefore affirmed the salvation from any other religion which contains only bits and pieces of the truth and graces of Christ. The one mediator is almost impossible to attain. It is an error to follow Karl Rahner's belief and teachings. And some other theologians who advocate the same principle, that sooner or later all religious sects, including Satanism, will lead them to heaven, the kingdom of God. It is therefore an error for all religious missionaries to no longer evangelize and baptize people. Pope Benedict XVI said, for when souls are not baptized, they are damned, as their entry into the Catholic Church is true baptism. What then is the Church? Our living tradition defines Church as the congregation of all baptized persons, united in the same true faith, the same true sacrifice, and the same sacraments under the authority of the Supreme Pontiff and the bishops in communion with him. A person becomes a member of the church upon receiving baptism. As Jesus said in Mark 16:16, 16, 16, and I quote, Unless you believe in me, and be baptized, you cannot be saved. The Bible clearly proves that Jesus Christ founded the church. Matthew 16, 13 to 18 reminds this when we read, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Not even the gates of hell shall prevail. After training the apostles and disciples to form the organization of his church, Christ chose Simon Peter to be the visible head of the church. Christ himself is the invisible head of his church, his body. 
John 21, 15 and 17 tells us that after the resurrection, Jesus said to Peter, Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Then in Mark 16, 15, we are told that Christ completed the founding of his church just before his ascension, when he said to his apostles, Go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. Christ then promised to remain for all times in the church he founded, which Matthew 28, 20 tells us, and I quote, Behold, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. Jesus told the apostles to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit, which he and his Father will send. After Pentecost Sunday, the apostles began to carry out their mission. Through them and their successors, this mission of making disciples of all nations continues and will continue until the end of the world. After receiving the Holy Spirit, Peter and the apostles preached, and 3,000 Jews were baptized and received into the church. They were the first members converted and baptized since the ascension of our Lord. The Catechism of the Catholic Church describes the church from various perspectives after Vatican II. First, the church in God's plan of salvation. This is paragraph 1 of Catechism, article 760. This article says that God, who is love, created the Word for the sake of communion with His divine life. Furthermore, it says that God permitted both the fall of angels in Lucifer's rebellion and the fall of men in Adam and Eve to respect their freedom as occasion to manifest His power and love that He wills to give the world. The article concludes by saying that man's faults occasions God's love to save mankind from sin, death, hell, and Satan in the Proto-Evangelium in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, by establishing the church. Acts 1, 5 to 6, and Article 737 of the Catechism prove as well that God's plan of salvation for mankind collectively was finished by Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. And the descent of the Holy Spirit concretely gave birth of the church. Remember what Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, 13 to 18. He said, You are Peter, and upon this rock, I shall build my church, and not even the gates of hell shall prevail. This means that the church repairs to the people whom God calls and gathers together from every part of the world. They form the assembly of those who through faith and baptism had become children of God, members of Christ, and temples of the Holy Spirit. This is confirmed by Article 147 of the Compendium of the Catholic Church. Now, based on Article 751 of the Catechism, the Scriptures give the following names to the Church. First, from the Old Testament, the church is called the people of God. Second, from the New Testament, the church is called the body of Christ, with Christ as head and the people as the body. 
This is also found in Article 148 of the Compendium. Based on Article 148 of the Compendium of the Catholic Church, the Scriptures attributes following images to the Church. From the New Testament, we find the following. First, in pastoral life, the Church is a sheepfold, flock, and sheep. Second, in agricultural life, the Church is the field, olive grove, vineyard. Third, in construction, the Church is the dwelling place, a stone and temple. Fourth, in family life, the Church is the spouse, mother, and family. The Catechism of the Catholic Church also gives the origin, foundation, and mission of the Church. Article 758 and onwards in the Catechism discuss this topic at length. But for general understanding, let me explain it briefly this way. Article 149 of the Compendium states that the Church finds its origin and fulfillment from the eternal plan of salvation of God. Mankind was damned after the fall of Adam and Eve, when they rebelled against God's covenant with their original sin. Then God called Abraham from Haran to go to Canaan to be the father of nations. Through his son Isaac, then Isaac's son Jacob, who became Israel, Jacob's 12 children grew into 12 tribes of Israel to become the chosen race, the people of God, who would save mankind from damnation. Through the kindness of Joseph, Jacob's son, who was sold into Egypt by his 11 brothers, Joseph became the liberator of his brothers from the famine that hit Canaan and the entire world. Jacob, or Israel, and his 12 sons were then invited by Joseph to settle in Egypt to avoid the famine. Under Pharaoh's rule, the children of Israel became prolific as a nation. Moses was raised by God to liberate the Israelites from their harshest slavery in Egypt to be brought into the promised land, which was Canaan. Led by Joshua, the Israelites, who occupied Canaan, became the sign of the church. The compendium of the Catholic Church further teaches the following. The church is Israel. It is the sign of future gathering of all nations. This is found in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we learn that at Pentecost, the Church, as the mystery of salvation, was born by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and founded by the words and actions of Jesus, fulfilled by His redeeming death and resurrection. Article 149 of the Compendium states that the Church is the assembly of all the redeemed of the earth, which is perfected in heaven. Article 150 of the Compendium says that the Church constitutes the kingdom of God, but here on earth it is only in its beginning.
Catechism also explains the mystery of the Church in the following articles, which are important for you to remember. In Article 7, 7, and 1, the Catechism says that the Church is a mystery of both a visible and spiritual, the invisible reality. Article 151, on the other hand, says that the Church is a mystery because in her visible reality and by faith, we can become aware of a divine spiritual reality. In Article 772, the Catechism calls the Church the mystery of man's union with God, whom we cannot see with our eyes, but become aware of His presence by His wondrous signs. And finally, Article 774, the Church is the universal sacrament of salvation, that is, a real sign of our liberation from sin, our sanctification to become children of God. Quoting Compendium, Article 152, it further says, The Church is the universal sacrament of salvation, that is, the sign and instrument both of the reconciliation and the communion of all of humanity with God and of the unity of the entire human race. Moving on, the Catechism further describes the Church from other perspective of the Vatican II as first, the Church is the people of God, the body of Christ, and the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is from paragraph 2, article 781 of the Catechism. Let's begin with the Church as the people of God. The Church is the people of God because it pleased God to sanctify and save men, not in isolation, but in making them into one people, gathered together by the unity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is found in Compendium, Article 153. How does one become a member of the Catholic Church? Article 154 of the Compendium says that one becomes a member of this people through faith in Christ and baptism. Christ said, He who believes in me and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. This is found in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. What then are the characteristics of the people of God? Referring to Article 154 of the Compendium, an article 782, an article 804 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we are told that this people of God has its origin, God the Father, for its head, Jesus Christ, for the life of the body, the Holy Spirit, for its hallmark, the dignity and freedom of the sons of God, for its law, the new commandment of love for its mission to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And finally, its destiny, the kingdom of God in heaven already begun on earth. In what way does the people of God share in the three functions of Christ as priest, prophet, and king. The explanation is given in Article 783 to Article 786 of the Catechism. Briefly, it means that the people of God participates in Christ's priestly office, that is the sanctification of the Church, insofar as the baptized are consecrated by the Holy Spirit 
to offer spiritual sacrifices. They share in Christ's prophetic office, that is, the teaching office, when, with a supernatural sense of faith, they adhere unfailingly to that faith and deepen their understanding and witness to it. The people of God share in Christ's kingly office, that is, the governing of the church, by means of service, imitating Jesus Christ, who as king of the universe made himself the servant of all, especially the poor and the suffering. Now, let's talk of the church as the body of Christ. In what way is the church the body of Christ? Through the Eucharist, the people of God are united among themselves in charity, and they become one body, the church of Christ. This is found in Compendium, Article 156. Who is the head of the church? St. Thomas Aquinas says that Christ is the head of the invisible body, the church, as we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. The church, therefore, lives for Him, in Him, and from Him. The head and members form, as it were, one and the same mystical person. This is also explained in Compendium Article 157. Why is the church called the Bride of Christ? Because the Lord Himself called her His spouse. This is found in Mark chapter 2, verse 19, and in Article 158 of the Compendium. Now, the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit because Article 159 of the Compendium says, The Holy Spirit resides in the body, which is the church, in her head, and in her members. You might ask, what then are charisms? Charisms are special gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are bestowed on individuals for the good of others and the needs of the Word in particular, for the building of the church. The discernment of charism falls under the responsibility of the magisterium. This is found in Article 160 of the Compendium. Catechism also describes the church as one holy, catholic, and apostolic. This is from paragraph 3, article 811 of the Catechism. Remember, Christ did not establish many churches, but only one, one church to continue till the end of time. As God is one, he established one church, which he commanded all men to obey and to follow in the way of salvation. And John 10.16 says it clearly, There shall be one fold, one shepherd. Christ likewise never referred to his churches, plural, but to the church, singular. Christ chose only one head for his church. Peter could not have been the head of conflicting churches. Jesus said in Matthew 16:18, and I quote, 
And I say to you, you are Peter. And upon this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ did not say, upon this rock I'll build my churches. It was clearly not Christ's intention to establish various conflicting churches. The chief marks of the church are fourfold. It is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. But the marks of the church, we mean certain clear signs by which all men can recognize it as the true church founded by Jesus Christ. A mark is a sign by which something may be distinguished from all others of the same kind. By its marks, we can recognize the true church as the one founded by Jesus Christ, distinguishing it from all other churches, however similar founded by men who have no authority from God to found a church. The church is one. Christ intended His church to be one. Therefore, the true church must be one. Its members must be united in doctrine, in worship, and in government. Three scriptural passages confirm this teaching. First, in Mark chapter 3, verse 24, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Second, in John 10, 16, There shall be one fold and one shepherd. Third, in John 17, 11, Holy Father, keep in thy name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. The church is one because she has as her source and exemplar the unity of the trinity of persons in one God. As her founder and head, Jesus Christ, reestablished the unity of all people in one body. As her soul, the Holy Spirit unites all the faithful in communion with Christ. The church has but one faith, one sacramental life, one apostolic succession, one common hope, and one and the same charity. This is clearly explained in Article 161 of the Compendium of the Catholic Church. The church also exists in the Catholic Church, governed by the successor of Peter and the bishops in communion with him. Only through this church can one obtain the fullness of the means of salvation, since the Lord has entrusted all the blessings of the new covenant to the apostolic college alone, meaning the bishops, whose head is Peter. Again, this is clearly explained in Articles 816 and 870 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. How do we consider then other non-Catholic Christians? This is fully discussed in Article 817 to 819 and 870 of the Catechism. But to briefly explain, these churches which are separated from full communion with the Catholic Church have elements of sanctification and truth that are found in these churches and ecclesial communities. All of these blessings come from Christ and leads to Catholic unity. These communities are incorporated into Christ by baptism and we recognize them as brothers. Article 163 of the Compendium also explains this. The Church is holy. In what way is the Church holy? It is Christ's intention for His Church to be holy. Therefore, the true Church must be holy. It must teach a holy doctrine. 
in faith and morals because its founder and head is holy. It must provide the source and means for its members to lead a holy life. The Holy Spirit gives her life with charity, and the Virgin Mary and numerous saints are her models and intercessors. Article 823 to 829 and Article 867 of the Catechism and Article 165 of the Compendium explains this further in detail. The Church is Catholic. It is called Catholic because the true Church of Jesus is universal, which means Catholic. It must be for all peoples of every nation for all times and teach the same faith everywhere. Christ commanded his disciples in Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. The church as such proclaims the fullness and the totality of the faith. This is further explained in Article 166 of the Compendium and Article 830 to 831 and Article 868 of the Catechism. Now you might ask, is the particular diocese or church Catholic? Yes, every particular church, diocese or eparchy for the Eastern Catholic Church is Catholic. Just by the way, the Universal Catholic Church is made up of the West, which is the Roman Catholic Church, and the East, the Eastern Catholic Church. It is formed by the community of Christians who are in communion of faith and the sacraments, both with their bishop. The Church presides among her members in charity, according to St. Ignatius Loyola. Who then belongs to the Catholic Church? Articles 836 to 838 of the Catechism explains this. To briefly answer, the following belong to the Catholic Church. 1. All human beings in various ways belong to her and are ordered to the Catholic unity of the people of God. 2. Fully incorporated into the Catholic Church are those who, possessing the Spirit of Christ, are joined to the Church by the bonds of the profession of faith, the sacraments, ecclesiastical government, and communion. And three, the baptized, who do not enjoy full Catholic unity, but are in a certain in perfect communion with the Catholic Church. What does it mean when we say Outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. Again, remember, all salvation comes from Christ, the head, to the Church, which is His body. Therefore, they cannot be saved. Those who, after knowing the Church as founded by Christ and is necessary for salvation, still refuse to enter her or remain in her. However, those who, through no fault of their own, and do not know the gospel of Christ and His Church, but sincerely seek God and, moved by grace, try to do God's will through the dictates of their conscience, can attain eternal salvation. But as Benedict XVI said in the beginning, it will be difficult and almost impossible. 
That is why it is important to evangelize all peoples, to make known that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of mankind. This is further explained in Article 171 of the Compendium and Articles 846 to 848 of the Catechism. Now another question. Why must the church proclaim the gospel to all nations? Because Jesus Christ has given the mandate in Matthew 28, 19, and I quote, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The missionary mandate of the Lord has its origin in the eternal love of God who has sent His Son and the Holy Spirit because as we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is further explained in Article 172 of the Compendium and Articles 849 to 851 of the Catechism. In what sense is the Catholic church missionary. Article 173 of the Compendium explains that the church, guided by the Holy Spirit, continues the mission of Christ Himself in the course of history. Christians must therefore proclaim to everyone the good news borne by Christ, and following His path, they must be ready for self-sacrifice even unto martyrdom. We discuss already the first three descriptions. One, holy, Catholic. And now, we come to the last. The church is apostolic. In what sense is the church apostolic? Our reference here is Article 857 and Article 869 with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Christ's Church is apostolic because it was propagated by Jesus Christ's apostles. Its leaders, who derive their office and authority by lawful succession from the apostles, are called bishops, in communion with the successor of Peter, who is the Pope. This is also explained clearly in Article 174 of the Compendium of the Catechism. The Church, therefore, must hold intact the doctrines and traditions of the Apostles, to whom Christ gave authority to teach. I repeat, it was Christ Himself who gave authority to teach and no one else. Jesus chose His Apostles and disciples and commanded them to teach His doctrines to all the world. This is clearly written in Matthew 16, 18. In Galatians 1, verse 8, St. Paul says, Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel to you other than that which we have preached, let him be anathema. Similarly, St. Paul repaired to the church in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, as built upon the foundation of the Apostles. In what then does the mission of the Apostles consist of? The Catechism explains this in detail from Article 858 to Article 861. Essentially, the word Apostle means one who is sent by Jesus to save souls through evangelization and by the sacraments. Jesus, the one sent by the Father, called to Himself twelve of His disciples and appointed them as His apostles, making them the chosen witnesses of His resurrection and the foundation of His church. He gave them the command to continue His own mission in saving souls, proclaiming the gospel, 
and administering the sacrament, saying, As the Father has sent me, so I also sent you, which we read in John 20, 21. Jesus also promised to remain with them until the end of the word, as mentioned in Article 175 of the Compendium. Now, there is what we call apostolic succession, as Article 861 to Article 865 of the Catechism explains it, including Article 176 of the Compendium. Apostolic succession is the transmission by means of the sacraments of holy orders of the mission and power of the apostles to their successors who today are the bishops. Thanks to this transmission, the Church remains in communion of faith and life with her origin, while through the centuries she carries on her apostolate of spreading the kingdom of Christ on earth. There are also cheap attributes of the Catholic Church. These are authority, infallibility, and indefectibility. These attributes are qualities or characteristics perfecting the nature of the Church. Let's discuss this further. By the authority of the Catholic Church, it means that the Pope and the bishops, as the lawful successors of the Apostles, have the power from Christ Himself to teach, to sanctify, and to govern the faithful and spiritual matters. Second, infallibility of the Catholic Church. What this means is that the Church, by the special assistance of the Holy Spirit, cannot err or commit any error when it teaches or believes a doctrine of faith and morals. This is because Christ promised, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. This is clearly written in Matthew 28:20. If then Christ is with the church all days, the church then cannot err in teaching. It cannot lead men away from God. In 1870, Pope Pius IX proclaimed the doctrine of papal infallibility, which means that the Pope cannot err or teach error when he speaks on matters of faith and morals ex cathedra a Latin term which means from the chair of the Apostle St. Peter, that is, in his role as supreme teacher of the Church. Therefore, in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority as Bishop of Rome, the Pope cannot err and be incorrect when he defines a doctrine concerning faith and morals to be obeyed by the whole Catholic Church. The Roman Pontiff exercises infallibility when, one, in virtue of his office as the Supreme Pastor of the Church or the College of Bishop in union with the Pope, especially when joined together in an ecumenical council. Two, when by a definitive act proclaim a doctrine pertaining to faith or morals. Three, when the Pope and bishops in their ordinary and universal magisterium are in agreement in proposing a doctrine as definitive. And four, when every one of the faithful must adhere to such teaching with the obedience of Catholic faith. This is found in Article 890 
to Article 891 of the Catechism and Article 185 of the Compendium. Third, the indefectibility of the Catholic Church. By indefectibility, it means that the Church, as Christ founded it, will last until the end of time. Proof of this is Luke 1, 32 to 33, when the Archangel Gabriel came upon Mary and announced that the child Jesus shall be king over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom shall be without end. Christ meant that his church would endure till the end of the world. It is to be indestructible and unchangeable, possessing great indefectibility. Christ, God himself, would have scarcely come and with such incredible pain and labor, founded a church that would die with the apostles. He came to save all men. Those who live in future ages needed salvation as much as the people of the apostolic times. Lastly, the fourth perspective given after Vatican II, which describes the Church. The Church are Christ faithful, that is, the hierarchy and the laity. Article 871 of the Catechism says that the Christian faithful are those who, as much as they had been incorporated to Christ through baptism, are constituted as the people of God since they share Christ's priestly, prophetic, and kingly office, they are called to exercise the mission which God has entrusted to the Church to fulfill in the world according to the condition proper to them. When Christ commanded His apostles to teach, to sanctify, and to rule the people of God, He instituted not only the holy orders for Peter, the head, and the twelve apostles, he also extended this command to save souls to their successors, the Pope head and the bishops apostles, and to the priests presbyters. In addition, Peter and the apostles and their successors, the Pope, the bishops and priests are assisted by lay people. Among the faithful or people of God, Therefore, we have the hierarchy, which are the clerics, and the laity. The constitution of the church is made up of, first, the hierarchy, which consists of the clerics. Christ instituted the head, who is the pope, assisted by the college of bishops and the priests. This is found in Article 873, and Article 934 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. These sacred ministers, who by divine institution have received the sacrament of holy orders, form what we call the hierarchy of the Church. Christ instituted the ecclesiastical hierarchy with the mission of feeding the people of God in His name and for this purpose gave it authority. The hierarchy is formed of sacred ministers, bishops, priests, and deacons. And thanks to the sacrament of holy orders, bishops and priests act in the exercise of their ministry in the name and in the person of Christ, the head. Deacons minister to the people of God in 
diakonia meaning service of word, liturgy, and charity. This is further explained in Article 179 of the Compendium. The second constitution of the Church is the lay faithful or the laity. In Article 178 of the Compendium, where we read additional discussions on the hierarchy and the laity, we also find what we call the consecrated life. There are certain faithful in both the hierarchy and the laity who are consecrated in a special manner to God by the profession of the evangelical councils, which are chastity or celibacy, poverty, and obedience. Finally, the church is described as communion of saints, consisting of three states. One, the church militant here on earth. Two, church suffering in purgatory, and three, church glorious in heaven. This is found in Article 954 to Article 959, and in Article 961 to 962 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. What else does communion of saints mean? This expression refers to the fellowship of or association between holy persons and by grace are united to the dead and risen Christ. Those who are living and are still on pilgrimage here on earth are those whom we call the church militant. Those who have passed from this life and are undergoing purification in purgatory and are being helped by our prayers is what we call church suffering. And those who are already enjoying the glory of God and are interceding for us is what we call church glorious or church triumphant. Together, these communion of saints form in Christ one family, the church to the praise and glory of the Holy Trinity. So why is the Church, the Catholic Church, important? Because outside the Church, as we have learned, there is no salvation. Christ made the Catholic Church the means of salvation and commanded all to enter it. Each one Every person, therefore, must be connected to the church in some way to be saved. Like Noah's Ark, which saved men from the universal flood, only through Christ and His mystical body, the church, can men be saved. They must be either in the ark of the church or at least hanging on the ropes which trail from its sides. Again, Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He who believes in me and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. Therefore, all are obliged to belong to the Catholic Church in order to be saved. They must be baptized by water to enter the church. This is called baptism by water. Let me clarify, however, this point. For those who are not members of the Catholic Church, they can be saved if, to no fault of their own, they do not know that the Catholic Church is the true Church founded by Christ. But still, they love God and try to do His divine will. For in this way, they are connected with the Church by desire, this is also called baptism by desire. Others who get killed while in the process of joining the Catholic Church because of their great desire to be Catholics can also be saved. This is also called baptism by blood. For those who want to become Catholics, they must have faith in God and His teachings and must be baptized 
with the baptism of repentance and the Holy Spirit. For those already Catholics, they must first live in the state of grace, following a sinless and grace-filled lifestyle, which means frequent confession, adoration, rosary, and the Eucharistic sacrifice of the Mass. Second, they must obey the Ten Commandments until death and perform good works of mercy to their neighbors. Third, they must offer their sacrifices daily by converting them into acts of reparation and victimhood in union with the passion and death of Jesus Christ, the one mediator, to the Virgin Mary as co-mediatrix. Truly, to gain heaven, which is our only goal in life, we must work hard for it. While we are here in this church militant, we must battle against everything that will prevent us from earning our eternal salvation. This episode on the church is a long and challenging one. But I suggest that you view this episode several times and read the references I listed at the end of this episode. Watch it alone. Watch it again with your family so that the explanation would become clearer. Even discuss the points I mentioned here among your family members and prayer groups. Remember, all alliance of the two hearts in throne families, especially our Afi Covenanted members, promoters, and youth leaders are required to answer these questions I posted after this. The questions are also found in the description box below. Don't forget to send me your answers via email to the address given. And please write your name, mailing address, your chapter area, and country where you send in your answers. As an incentive, I will give you a special gift to all those who would immediately and regularly send their answers to the questions I listed after each episode. You will receive it by mail. I hope you are all subscribed to our two YouTube channels. And don't forget, to click the notification bell. Lastly, I have uploaded special videos on our AFI International YouTube channel, which you can use in your prayer meetings and group discussion. You can use it too for your home evangelization. You can forward them to your friends and family members. See you in our next episode on Mary in the plan of salvation. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.